It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and your host, Chris Larry. Hello, welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogstein Network, the show where we look at the dollars and cents of the sports media business legal industrial complex in its daily 365 grind how you doing today steve i'm doing all right man how about you oh not bad you know just hanging out here at the end of the world there's a lot of weird like weird nonsense going on in sports business which is always entertaining for people like us like the nerds of the world who are willing to follow and enjoy following all this stuff so um we're excited to get into a whole bunch of a whole bunch of different stories, of course. I'm I'm mostly glad that baseball's back because I need a sport to follow, for God's sakes. I saw my Dodgers re-sign Clayton Kershaw, which makes me happy. I think they would have had a riot in Los Angeles if they had let him go. Because I, I, it was like hours after the strike ended, Kershaw re-signed with the Dodgers. Even but only a one-year deal, right? Yeah, but it's good enough for now. You know, at least they re-signed him. Um you know, and then this ownership group is so wrapped up into uh, uh, the sabermetric stuff that I was kind of wondering if they'd let him go. But I think even they realize that Clayton Kershaw is a, kind of above sabermetrics in terms of need, you know, and in, in his value to the franchise. Well, they'll get him for one more year, but they'll get everybody for one more year as uh, or many more years actually as baseball uh and its players union have come to an agreement on a new labor deal which means baseball can now resume kind of pick up and do a you know kind of a accelerated off season and spring training they do claim that they're going to play all the games so this does not appear that it will um cost any of the 162 and Steve, we'll get into the details, but pretty much the, the general consensus, the conventional wisdom is that this probably was a victory for the players and maybe even they left some on the table. Um, I don't know, man. I, I mean, a, a big part of me says that this seems to be a fairly down the middle settlement. Um. Uh, you know, the luxury tax threshold did go. Uh, well, what we said at the beginning was that the luxury tax was the big was the big thing. Right. And so they were at, you know, I don't know when we did this show the last you know two weeks ago, they were at something like 210, 210 million. It was what the owners had put on the table, maybe 220 million was what the owners had put on the table. And then players at 275, they ended at 230. <laughs> You know, for for the minimum threshold, and then there it goes up every year, and there's graduated levels and stuff. So I don't know if I would call that a huge player win. Uh, you know, the fundamentally the owners maintained the um, sort of the same basic financial structure for the league, and so in that respect, I think they're happy. They knew there the threshold was going to have to go up. Uh, um, so you know, two thirty probably more than they wanted, but certainly nowhere close to what the players wanted so i don't you know they they got the play expanded playoffs which i think are dumb but you know it is what it is um i do think that it's a win for the players that they got the minimum salary raised a little bit um they got this a bonus pool for younger players going of course all that's kind of chump change i mean you know by um you know league standards compared to the 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 threshold so i don't know if i'd call it a player's win I, I think it's one of these like nobody's happy which means it's probably a pretty good settlement situations yeah i, I was um well what the other slight win for the players was uh, a slight change not a radical change but a slight change in the in the rookie eligibility you know the rookie you know Towards terms of service idea, you now well, yeah. So what? So the, they if you're if you're an all if basically if you win rookie of the year, you, you get you don't get you can't get that. They can't do that. What was that one Cubs player? They can't do that thing where they put you on the bench or put you in the minors for the first twelve well, games. Every team has done that to every yeah. player. It seems like so. What he's talking about here is is they're manipulating terms of service or uh, uh, service length for purposes of 
arbitration, okay? And so that's what Chris is talking about here. So what happens here, was it Chris Bryant that happened to maybe? Yeah. He's talking about, but, you know, like my Dodgers did it and every team's done it. So what they're talking about here is is you have, you have to have a certain number of days in Major League Baseball as opposed to the minor leagues, meaning the major league, to get credit for a first year. And so what almost every team does is they'll keep these talented, the Chris Bryants of the world, in – major in the major leagues until literally one day before they get full credit and then they'll send it back to the minors for the rest of the year and so it's basically manipulating service time um and so they did change some rules about that and what they changed were the number of times a player can be optioned down uh, you know because there's only so many times that a player can be sent back to the minors and so uh, limiting the number of options will help, I think, that. But they're, look, they're always going to manipulate service time. So, but that, that's a minor point, though, in terms of the overall hierarchy of what was important. Number one, the owners want some sort of salary cap, even a soft cap. And they got, you know, they maintained that at a level that wasn't too outrageous. The. Yeah, basically with Bryant, you had a situation where somebody win literally wins rookie of the year and isn't technically playing on their rookie season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then gets yeah because he got sent down the year before. And yeah, so it, you know his time rolled into the next year. It's ridiculous, you know, because the guy spent like half a season essentially in the major leagues the year before, and why is he still a rookie? Well, because they manipulated his service time. And that all te- yes, and Steve's right. All teams are going to manipulate whatever the rules are. That's that's just. I mean, that's why you have rules. So you play to the edge of them. That everyone that plays a game understands that. Um, yeah, that's, it's not really manipulation, in, meaning that it was illegal. It's like yeah, you, you play to the edge of the right. Right. It's, you, it's yeah. gamemanship is the is the yes. gentleman's way of saying it. Yeah. Um, but a couple one so and I'm in the athletic an article by what's his name evan drellich he and this is more of a column it's not an article uh although it's got a lot of news reporting in it but he was saying he thinks it's a little bit of a win for the players and one of his pieces of evidence was that you didn't you didn't you know a third of the union reps voted against it and everybody on a on the union leadership subcommittee um voted against it so, and this, you know, so the, basically the, some of the players that most dealt with the the negotiations, now some of that is probably theatrics, right? Because you always want to look like a third of you oppose something because it helps you keep leverage as you go forward and whatnot. So some of that is game and ship as well. Um, but you, and, and that he, his reporting said that at the league office, there was more of a sense of, of relief and and uh hap- and that they f- felt like they didn't have to give even a little bit more which to your point is that all sides are a little bit mixed it means that we probably have a good pretty good deal and i think you know cuz even 2 weeks ago when we did this show it looked a little bit more fractured um but i think they realized that they couldn't afford a long delay i think ultimately why you have a deal that's probably well rounded and everyone gives and gets a little bit is because I think they saw that they further they slipped into spring, how irrelevant they could potentially be, become. You know, I mean, there's not a lot on any news right now because of, you know, war in Europe and things like that. I mean, at some point, you just have to say, we're talking about billions. There's a path forward here. And, you know, being off the air, out of people's mind. And when people do think of you, they think of you as annoying about fighting over billions was good, was just bad for business. And I was I was surprised if you just look at poll to poll the last time we recorded a show to this time we recorded a show and even what's changed in that two weeks, they got it done pretty fast. Oh, yeah, yeah, they did. And and, and if you think back to the last time they lost a season, which was what, 95, I think, it yeah. surely did destroy the fan base entirely. And it took you know, the conventional wisdom is at least it took the Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, steroid home run chase to really get the fan base back. And I don't think baseball could afford to lose fans at that clip anymore. Cause that was 20 years ago. It was you know, almost, yeah, it was more than 20 years ago. And it's a different time. Uh, you know, there's so much, so many more distractions now than there were uh, i mean i think once if you lose a fan base in today's media market you have a really hard time get, getting it back and so ultimately um yeah i think the owners knew 
that they couldn't afford. You know, they can lose a few games probably, but they couldn't afford to lose a substantial chunk of the season for sure. And in terms of the players, you know, the vote, because, yeah, about a third of them voted against it. I, I think the players union, and this is true for every sports union, but especially baseball, there's a really – there's a have and have not level of hierarchy in the players union. Cause the, you know, like Max Scherzer was one of the negotiators, former Dodger. Um, and he's making whatever he's making, $30 million a year or whatever, a huge amount of money, but there's a whole lot of players, uh, you know, that are, you know, having the service time manipulated or ma- minimum salary. And, and it's a ton of money compared to regular people, but by baseball standards, it's a real have or have not thing. And, and I think, all sports unions, but especially baseball, has a kind of a habit of looking out for the senior, most expensive people, wherein they don't always care so much about the regular folks. And I think one of the things that this settlement did was they did try to take care of the quote regular folks via, you know, all these things we've talked about the um, the raise in minimum salary, this you know, player bonus pool thing, um, you know, the service time manipulation stuff. So they did try um, to take care of the little guy, which is, I think, unusual uh, a little bit. The new minimum salary is now 700000 which is an increase of, uh, well, a hun- almost 130000 from where the, the previous floor was. So this is why everybody also that. realizes that, you know, there's only limited amount of tolerance when they're in the middle of a recession, you know, and there's all those sorts of awful things for these people fighting over this level of money. At some point, the public's going to go, just screw all of you. You know, so they really well, and, need to get done. And as opposed to like 90, whatever, 94, 95, or the, the full season lockout and all that, you know, what they had to deal with then was anger, right? What they have to deal with now is apathy. And, you know, that's a, you know, anger is passion. Anger is interest. Anger is caring. Apathy is a whole different beast. And they have to deal with apathy regardless of labor strikes. So I think you look, I think that kind of looking into that abyss was where I think it's, it pulled them up short. Yeah. I mean, cause young people are just going to go look at TikTok instead of watch baseball. Yeah. I mean, they got. Yeah, so a million things. I mean, I'm being facetious, but there's a million more things out there to interest people, particularly young people, which is the demo that baseball needs the most. But, you know, is that um, and this is why a lot of the, the, the changes in the game, you know, like one of the things that they've eliminated the shift, which I think, again, is dumb, uh, um, you know, from a baseball perspective, because, you know, if you want to line up every player on one side of the field, you know, good on you. But what it's doing was preventing offense, which is preventing excitement, which is what they want the young people to see, you know. And so, you know, in, in like the pitch count and the designated hitter, all these things are designed to generate more offense, which is generating more excitement, which hopefully will generate interest in young people. Yeah. So I think they wised up and got it done. It Two things that are going to be interesting for baseball fans are – baseball watchers or just the business of sports even um, is you're going to see now just a crazy town, like supermarket sweepstakes style free agency. Um, and it happened like before this show was released. Yeah, it's going to be nuts. So there's going to be certainly a lot of moves. Cause as we talked about last time, I think there's like a ton of players that were unsigned. And then two, they're given the fact that they're going to have lost time, committed to playing a 162 game schedule and now have to jam in a 12 team league playoffs there, there, there's going to be some scheduled gymnastics to get all that done and they also have claimed they're not going to move the world series dates yeah i think that they, they are they're playing on nine more double headers than normal to get yeah. it done and that's nine more nine inning double headers which is a lot uh, you know it's a lot of baseball of course again i mean anybody cuz my kids play baseball forever and i've played in every tournament there is or watched every tournament there is it seems like and um baseball more than other sports can do this and they're all used to doing it you know because these baseball tournaments for like young people go days and days and days and they're playing three or four games a day and you know sometimes so i think baseball can do that it's uh major leagues are a bit prima donna ish a little bit i think uh, about it but baseball players got like football you can do that obviously even basketball, there's a limit, um, but baseball, I think they can get it done. So at the end of the day, um, they're getting a the full season in. Nobody cares if 
the players have to exert themselves a little bit more to get some double headers and nobody cares. Yeah. I think it might be more interesting how they do the playoffs. I think that's where it'll be even a little bit more crazy. And I think they're doing some things with like more bundled, bundled series and things like that. So it'll be interesting. You know, at least we can concentrate on the ramifications of the Dune deal and not the uh, construction of the new deal. If you care about baseball, how do you, uh, what do you feel about the expanded playoff situation? Uh, well, one, it was inevitable, right? So like, it sort of was coming like a, you know, there wasn't anything to avoid it. I think it was too big a revenue generator. I think I read one thing that said that the extra wild card games meant $85 million from ESPN to major league baseball alone. So, uh, and you know, the players, I'm sorry, the owners are looking to recoup, you know, what even their perceived losses through this deal. So, um, you know, I think it's the way of sports. We're seeing it in all the sports have done that. Baseball being the most traditional was the slowest to move, although they have also moved. So I think it's they viewed it as just stepping into the modern world, plus the revenue. I, I just don't I don't like it, but I'm an anachronism. I kind of like the old school limited playoffs. Only the good teams get in. And, you know, they're kind of moving down towards the basketball uh, arena wherein you know if you're even barely winning team you can get in the playoffs and i, I don't like that but from a business standpoint chris is 100 percent right i mean it's a revenue thing and don't forget the league lost what hundreds of millions of dollars of billions of dollars maybe in the coronavirus year 2020 you know they don't really want to lose more money obviously and so the expanded playoffs is sort of kind of a way to recoup that a little bit yeah, no, I, I yes, a hundred percent. I think one thing that's an unintended consequence of this that I think they're going to miss come playoff time is, you know, the one game wild card really be, had a life it's a of its own. Yeah, it was a really unique thing in sports. Of course, the NFL works that way, but that football is so physically different that that's just obvious. So this, I thought, you know, and I think they're going to miss that. That became like a real moment in baseball's calendar when you had that, you know, win and you're in game. Yeah, and there's some strategy involved in it. You yeah. Know, do you burn your ace pitcher only and then you're going to lose him basically for the series? And, you know, there's a lot of things that went into that. And it was certainly cool. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be gone. Yeah, so that's that's uh, that has now been sacrificed. All right, Steve. So that was our big. That was really the the big news. Ob- our obvious number one here. But we've gotten you know a, a few legal updates uh, recently of stories we've tracked. Uh, the first one, obviously, which is you know fairly breaking news as we record this on on Saturday morning, and even as you hear this early in the week, it's I'm sure all the talking heads um, will still be chewing on it. And who knows? Maybe there's even a player movement on it. But uh, Deshaun Watson will not face any criminal charges from uh, Massage Gate as he, as a grand jury found him, I think, um, did not suggest a trial on seven, seven counts, nine counts. Yeah, I think it was maybe nine counts, I believe. So look, here's the thing. Because i got to explain this for the kids in the back. Because we've gotten a bunch of those on the hog sty who don't seem to understand what's going on here. So, um, the grand jury's job is to indict. Meaning they take testimony presented by the prosecutor. And then they decide whether or not, to, that the, whether or not the case should be sent to trial. <laughs> this grand jury declined to send the cases to trial. Meaning Watson is off the hook. So, um, this does not mean that he proved his innocence. This means that the grand jury declined to indict. Why did they not indict? Well, it's almost certainly because in this kind of case, there's no physical evidence. I think the state could have probably easily proved that there was like an appointment, you know, a series of appointments made through, you know, text records and whatnot. But at the end of the day, what happened in the room or rooms between Watson and these women is a matter of, he said, she said testimony. And Watson didn't testify. He took the fifth wisely. And so what's the state left with? One witness for each allegation. And that's just not enough normally to meet the criminal evidentiary standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's why I would bet an amount of money that matters to me that that is why the grand jury did not indict Watson. Um, So that's that. Um, for in terms of criminals, so that leaves all the civil lawsuits, which are still sitting there, 
Um, it also means we may see Watson finally testify about it in depositions, and whatnot, but all of that's got to be resolved. Um, but in terms of the NFL, I mean, look, the NFL has enough to suspend him now. Okay. And they've decided they've declined to do so. The NFL's standard of proof for suspension is lower than a civil standard, civil lawsuit standard. It, you know, they just have to have, I forget the wording. I should have looked it up. It's something like, um, they have to have a reasonable, a reasonable belief that rules were broken, something along those lines. Um, so if, if the NFL wanted to suspend him, they would have already done it, and they clearly don't want to. It, you know, so my guess, I, I would assume, I don't assume. If you ask me to guess, I would say Watson probably doesn't get suspended. The NFL lets him resolve these, you know, settle these twenty-two lawsuits on his own. And he's just going to forever be the massage gate guy. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, certainly a path. And this, you know, you know, thanks for explaining that. And I knew, you know, I knew people would would overreact to a degree. But so it's called a lot of names. Yeah. But uh, let's also remember that it was a huge moment in this saga. Uh, and a few things. One, let's just, I know you'll talk about this on Hogside and all that, but let's just get one, let's just sort of clear the board on one thing. It's highly probable that Washington knew he was not going to come here. He was going to, he's going to, was going to have enough suitors. Uh, they talked to his agent at the combine. They, one of the reasons they rushed into a thing like Wentz is because they probably had all the indications that he was not going to accept a, a trade here. So whatever happened here doesn't necessarily have meant anything. It's not like, oh, they waited two days. And uh, all of the things about this team, that player, are still 100% in, in effect. However, I think for Deshaun Watson, the player, and what happens now at a, at a league level, I do think this, this uh, you know, choosing not to indict is pretty huge on a couple levels. One, um, I do think that this means that the barrier to risk for any team trading him is significantly lower um, on, you know, from, you know, doesn't have to face the criminal charges. He can leave a state, all kinds of stuff. Right. Uh, you know, I think if there was a criminal trial, the league would be forced to probably put something in. So there's a whole bunch of things now that don't materialize because there's no indictments. And if you're a team like the Steelers who think you have a culture that can deal with it, or a team like the Panthers who are desperate enough with still fresh faced ownership, they're, they're going to be able to make a risk calculation here at some point that make this doable for them um, in a way that the decision from Friday wildly changes their calculus. I also, and I'll throw this back to you, Steve, I also wonder, does this mean we get a faster settlement? You know, because if these, it, it, you know, in the civil cases, if they see there's not going to be a criminal thing proceed, it does have some implications on maybe not whether they can get money, but how much money they're able to extract. And so I do wonder if the if the settlements start to fall here. Uh, yeah, no, I think the settlements definitely start to fall. You really can't do much with the civil lawsuits until the criminal is resolved, you know, because it's too dangerous. And so now that that threat is off the table, yeah, I think um, Watson would be crazy not to just pay, uh, pay them all off and be done with it and move on. Because also, think about this. You know, these are 22 separate lawsuits. They've been combined for discovery purposes by the Harris County court system. But what they haven't done is combined them all into one lawsuit for trial purposes. And so what you have here is 22 separate lawsuits that have to go to trial 22 times, absent either dismissal by the court or a settlement. And so this could go on for years. He could be doing nothing but trials, you know, for this. Because uh, what are the odds of... Uh, sure, maybe you get a couple of them dismissed, uh, you know, for evidentiary reasons or whatever. But what are the odds that all of them get dismissed? Like slim and none. So I, it's the only way to get himself back into the position where he could play football and the morally compromised out there would be willing to play him is if the lawsuits go away. And and uh, so, yes, I think now we will see the dominoes fall and the lawsuits go away. And in terms of Washington, yeah, we'll talk about it on the hog side, but um there's not a team in the league that needs him less. <laughs> you know, when you have an owner who's embroiled in a sexual misconduct scandal, the last thing you need to bring in is a face of the franchise quarterback who has a massive sexual misconduct scandal. 
you know, think about the optics, you know, there, it's a terrible look and a terrible decision and they were wise in not doing it. And I think Chris is probably right when he says that the team knows, because don't forget Watson has a no trade clause, yep. uh, you know, and, and also maybe the team is maybe Ron Vera's smart enough to realize they don't need this kind of headache. And Ron Rivera isn't the type that puts up with nonsense anyway, compared to a lot of like, and there's the NFL coaches out there who would like urban Meyer, has no moral compass at all. He would put up with anything. He did it Florida. He did it Ohio State. Um, even some of the choices he personally made. So would you know? I, I think it depends on the organization. But but Ron Rivera cut Darius Geis in about a day of him getting charged with domestic violence. And who was the corner he got rid of too? Um, uh, Quentin Dunbar. Uh, Dunbar. Yeah, got rid of him instantaneously. Also, so I don't think he's the type of coach that would want this. Um, out there, he he went on a player with these kind of charges because again, like I've said, I I've thought back through the history of sports in my lifetime. I can't think of another player who's had this many accusations thrown at him all at once. He's kind of alone in this. There's well, been Tiger Woods, although well, those weren't those weren't necessarily criminal. Those were just affairs. I, I forgot about Tiger. Yeah, Tiger's another one. It, there there would be another one, and, and it ruined Tiger's career. By the way, he never really he came back from it sort of eventually, but it destroyed his whole mojo for years, you, you know? Yeah. It's a good point. Forgotten about tiger tiger's probably the other one. Cause he had a whole bunch of porn stars, you know, out there claiming he, and it wasn't even misconduct though. It was just, he's having, no, just being a, just being he's sweet. being a turd. Right. Um, so yeah, this is different. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that you, you, you need either a team that's morally compromised or you need a team that has a very strong leadership team on it who could think they could deal with it maybe the Steelers would be the strong side and then you've got like some team that's just desperate you know we don't care what you did as long as you're not going to prison um which is kind of a sad way to operate but yeah there'll be a team out there that does it yeah and I think yeah I think Pittsburgh and I think even to a slightly lesser degree the Eagles think they're that and then the Car- Carolina fits the bill as the desperate and big, yeah, and you know, kind of wild, wild swings out there. We're not even thinking about probably. Yeah. So we'll see. I would be, I, I think by the time we record again, I think it will be resolved is my guess. I think it'll come quickly now. Not that I'm not, I'm not saying the civil lawsuits. I'm saying where he, what team controls his rights. And I will predict that I think he, let's say he settles a bunch of these lawsuits. Let's say he lands in a, Pittsburgh, I think at that point, the league will put a four to six game suspension on him. I think that'll be I think that'll be the closeout, a relatively small slap on the wrist style NFL suspension that will begin the new placement. I think that the NFL is very, very leery of turning him into a martyr, another Colin Kaepernick style martyr. That's what I think. I think they are very loath to um, suspend a franchise level quarterback, particularly one who's African American um, in some situation like this. So it would not surprise me if they did what you said, which is some relatively small suspension just to say they did something. Cause I don't think they want um, Watson to be the face of the NFL aggrieved another player. Like some people view Kaepernick. So I think that's probably why they never put him on the commissioner ex- ex- exemplus in the first place. I think if this had happened to like the left guard for, for some team, the dude would have been on the commissioner's list all this time and it wouldn't have been a question, but they don't do it to Watson and they force the Texans to carry his salary cap, his salary cap hit it, 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 on the active roster all year, a player they couldn't play. You know, basically, they forced them to have a 52 man roster. It was all because I think they really have they, the NFL is afraid of the optics. And so, yeah, I think they want to get rid of it as soon as possible, suspend him for five minutes and say, we did something. And then, you know, look at it. Here's another shiny toy over here. Please look at this. I think as we open the NFL season, he'll be a Pittsburgh Steeler. The lawsuits will be mostly settled, if not completely settled. And we will be experiencing Mason Rudolph for the first six weeks in in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad guess. Not a bad guess. 
Uh, all right. So we had another uh, legal case that we've talked about a number of times over the years at this point in in that the U.S. Uh, women's national soccer team won its lawsuit about equal pay. Um, I believe that's the case or, or that's the, the very basic uh, explanation of it, right? Well, I know uh, they didn't win a lawsuit. <laughs> um, but they settled. Is, they settled a lawsuit. Now, everybody needs to understand that their lawsuit was a steaming pile of garbage from the beginning. Um, here's the thing. The men's national team and the women's national team each separately negotiated collective bargaining agreements with the U.S. Soccer Federation. Um, the men's team negotiated a deal wherein they were basically independent contractors, if anybody out there knows about employment law stuff. Um, so the men got paid um, basically per game, and it was a percentage of income. There were no benefits associated with that, anything. And the reason is all the men's players were all playing in Europe in other leagues, and they were making a fortune doing that. The women's team, there is not a real market for women's professional soccer. Sorry, people, but it's true. And so what the women's team did was negotiate a deal wherein they had benefits uh, and they were salaried. Um, and, and so the and, and the other thing is the income from the w men's World Cup is 10 times more than the income from the women's World Cup. OK, is a very stark difference. And so the basic premise of the pay levels, independent contractor versus salary had to do with income. So what has the history of what has happened here is that the women's team first filed a lawsuit in 2016 under Title seven Equal Pay Act. Um, and that lawsuit got dismissed. Um, then they filed a 2019 gender discrimination lawsuit, and then that lawsuit also got dismissed, and that lawsuit is hung up in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, because the women's team filed an appeal of the dismissal of their lawsuit. Then they filed in just like a few days ago, like the end of February, an equal employment opportunity EOC complaint. And that is what settled, okay? Um, and so the U.S. Soccer Federation settled. Basically, they're paying them $24 million, and they agreed to pay the women on the same terms as the men in terms of terms, and they also agreed to pay them equal amounts. The reason why I said all this was a steaming pile of garbage is that there really wasn't discrimination here, Um the women's team negotiated their own settlement of their own free will and signed a collective bargaining agreement. That's why their lawsuit kept getting dismissed. It rightly so. Um, and the income disparity between men's and women's soccer is a real thing. Sorry to say, but it's true. Now the soccer federations settled it probably because they don't want the bad optics. And so we'll pay them and they'll be done. But from a legal perspective, the women's case was really junk and which is why they kept losing. Although I guess they eventually won. Well, they settled and they got what they wanted in the end. But I think it was more a business decision than anybody was ever afraid of the legal consequences of, of their allegations. Yes, but m often a legal path is just to get to a quicker business decision. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we talked about the Brian Flores lawsuit a month ago. Same thing. His lawsuit's a pile of junk, too. Um, but that wasn't really the point of why he was doing it. And that's the women certainly didn't want to try this case because they'd get slaughtered and they knew that but all these laws all these claims they kept filing over and over and over again are all designed to put public pressure on soccer federation because they can send them go look we're poor aggrieved women here you know we're, we're not getting paid equally and they say it enough and eventually uh the soccer federation gets tired of being accused of it and they just surrender and pay and that's sort of what happened so there you go on that one. Um, <laughs> doesn't sound like Chris agrees with my analysis at all, which I mean, is fine. I, I, I actually don't disagree with your analysis in terms of that's how it played out. I just think, you know, I, 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 yay them. They played the game and won. You know, they could have easily played the game and lost. So, you know, I mean, does that? I, it doesn't bother me that they get equal pay. Oh, it doesn't bother uh, me. No, I mean, so, you I mean, know, I, whatever. What, bo <laughs> what bothers me is they're alleging stuff that's 
blatantly false, <laughs> you, you know, and they're just ignoring the fact that they signed a deal on the terms they wanted. They wanted benefits. The men's team did not want benefits. They wanted benefits, and all of a sudden, it's just the worst thing ever after you turned around and agreed to it all. So it, that part irritates me a little bit. But, yeah, I mean, good for them. They got what they wanted. You know, you know good for you ladies, I guess. One thing, and this is a sort of a broad takeaway. This is just a, a drop in the bucket. This example is just a drop in the bucket. Is there any, any industry or business sector where a contract means less than sports? <laughs> Seriously, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if you think about any sport you can name, NFL, the NFL can terminate almost any contract whenever they want. <laughs> you know, these soccer, the soccer women, you know, signed their contract and then turned around and said they were aggrieved for having been forced to sign it. Crazy. Um, uh, you know, the only contracts that really mean anything, I guess, in terms of sports would be uh, NBA and MLB player contracts because they're fully guaranteed, but even then they can get sent home. Yeah, you know, and then and players throw snits if they don't, you know. I mean, yes, it just um, and they it's obviously a pretend have some, contract for sure. Yeah, yeah, they just they're just not as not as a powerful an instrument as they are in most other industries. Yeah, you can't have these arguments outside of sports. No, you know, <laughs> anywhere else it would be. Well, wait, you signed a collective bargaining agreement. Why is there a lawsuit? Go to the go to the uh, National Labor Relations Board if you have an argument about it, and um, you know there would be no dispute that there was nothing wrong here. But in sports, you can you know it's a high profile public thing. You can create um, you know generate sympathy. Most the American public generally takes the players' sides over the league slash governing body side um, for whatever reason. So yeah, you can. Um, you know, a part of it's the celebrity part of it. You, you can generate a lot of sympathy because you have a lot of people listening to your whining in the case of the women's team. So, yes. Yeah, so keep that in mind when you see uh, contracts in sports. There's always uh, some backdoor out. Ain't even the if paper that... they're, they're written right. on. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but speaking of new contracts, uh, 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 Mr. Captain Hairplugs himself, Joe Buck, uh, flipped. You know that story, right? No, I don't. Tell me. In his uh, autobiography that came out, this is probably ten or fifteen years, this is a chunk of time. He made a claim that he was uh, addicted, and all the reasons, you, you know, ways you might interpret that word to hair plugs. Oh my god! Are you and he serious? did it like this great, like you know, let me lay my soul bare. You know, let me share my troubles with you. You know, my battle with addiction. Dot dot dot. Hair plugs. Oh my god. I, that's just that's just so unbelievably ridiculous. And there's people out there who battle real addictions. Yeah. And I have the utmost sympathy for the drug addicts and the alcoholics and the gambleholics and sexaholics and all the Joe Buck is addicted to hair plugs. That's just yeah. that's got to be the single dumbest thing that's ever happened in the universe. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, so that's why I love I, I can't mention Joe Buck without talking about hair plugs, but he can buy a lot of hair plugs now because I think he's just about to sign or has signed. The details aren't out necessarily, but a five year contract with ESPN. It's estimated to be in the, anywhere in the 60 to 75 million range. Steve, have you yeah. gotten closer to a real number? Yeah. So uh, first of all, I'm look what I'm looking at is Bleacher Report. Um Doric Sam published March 8th, 2022 report. Joe Buck expected to get a five-year contract offer from ESPN in the $60 million to $75 million range. So it's a five-year deal. And so what you're talking about, average annual value would be 12 to 15. Here's what's interesting to me, Chris. He was already making 11 at Fox Sports. You know, so what this means is Fox didn't want him. Uh, I want him enough, yeah. Well, yeah, because it's in... in it certainly would be a lot of money to you and I, but in the world of, in, in these people's worlds, you know, a million, you know, one, two, three million a year is not a ton of money by, by their standards. And so, and, um, instantly also, I mean, I'm deviating here, but Troy Aikman came out this week and said, Fox never bothered to make a offer to him, <laughs> you know? And so these two guys, Fox is kind of letting walk because f five years, 60 to 75 million, isn't a ton more than what he was already making. 
So I thought this was very interesting that Fox just went, eh, if you want to go, go, uh, you know, and they're going to promote, um, uh, you know, what's a Greg Olson and his partner to kind of be the number one and, you know, yeah, move Kevin on. Burkhart. Yeah. And, and I, I, it's got to be because, you, like you said, I, I thought it was a good point two weeks ago, which is that Joe Buck does the World Series. You know, it's a big deal for him. And he left that for a million, you know, a couple million dollars more, which, again, means says to me that Fox didn't really want him. For yeah, that doesn't reason. surprise me. One, you know, to the NBC, to NBC, ESPN and now Amazon, the team means more, right? The prime time, you know, the, the broadcast team means a little bit more in the prime time games. They're event television. You know, they help carry a brand. Fox's afternoon slate, I mean, yes, they want to have a well-known team. I'm not saying they don't want to have a number one team, but that's a captured audience, right? They they have half the league on Sunday afternoon. You know, they're dividing up where their human resources in terms of their announcing teams go every week. It's a different beast. So they're not as, they're not as desperate for, you know, quote unquote, top tier talent uh, as the primetime time. Uh, primetime broadcast rights holders are. So they can, yeah, you know, and and I think this applies to, for Fox uh, as well. They want to develop new talent too. You know, Joe Buck was clogging up a bunch of stuff. He sat right there smack in the Clogging middle of their- hair plugs. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but, you know, and I got, I don't, I didn't, I start with a place of not liking Joe Buck, you know, he's a, to me, it's like a nepotism thing is a little bit gross. And then I just, I just don't think he's actually that good. And I find him annoying, but now, and now I've got to watch him on two marquee events. I just get, I would get annoyed every fall, you know? So, <laughs> and I think Fox, I think they realize that too. Now we can develop, we can build a deeper venge in baseball. We can grow a, a new brand. It's probably just seen as an opportunity for them and they don't need him or Aikman on Sunday afternoons the same way that they need him in the nights. Well, yeah. And I told you last time, Chris, that I thought I didn't totally understand why these guys are making this much money and maybe Fox had just had enough. It's like, okay, even this is our, this is it for us. We're not paying you more. It's not beneficial for us. It's not driving a bigger audience at all. Like you said, it's it's you know these are not marquee games. It's just they're they're the premier games of the af- Sunday afternoon, it, you know. But so what? And at some point, we're just done. And it sounds like maybe that's kind of where Fox was with both of them, um, you know, Aikman and Buck. Y- you know, and I understand you know Joe Buck's kind of a turd and all that. Uh, but he is popular, you know, you, you don't like him, which is fine. I'm not too wild about him either. Um, but I think that Fox could get the same kind of benefit, the same kind of performance and reaction out of some other team. Like you said, I mean, Greg Olson, Tony Romo, whoever else. I mean, he's Romo CBS, isn't he? But regardless, um, I, yeah, I don't think the benefit is there, which is why, you know, if you want to get a raise and – you know, this is it, and this is the line, and we're not going to cross it, and bye. And yeah. there's tons of legendary quarterbacks hitting the broadcast yeah. boots market over, you know, now over the next two, four years. So there's Two's also, days. yeah, so there's, there's tons of those people to pick They up. did approach Brady. Somebody has approached Brady about broadcasting. Oh, they're going to ask all the time, anytime yeah. there's a thing. Yeah, so there's also, it's like, you know, let ourselves be in the market to, to bring in, you know, new talent. So I think that's what... Fox did it's you know and from Joe Buck's perspective I mean you go you get more money you you work less quite frankly you know more money and work less you know you know where you're you know that you're going to be on Monday nights it's a much more clean schedule uh you know maybe he got sick of doing two sports so you know it's sort of one of those things that makes sense for all parties I can see why ESPN wants to just sort of you know put a established booth right right in there uh you know i think what's his face uh greasy became a quarterbacks coach somewhere where did he uh he just joined oh, somebody's, he? yeah yeah he just joined somebody's oh, shanahan i think um i think he just joined san francisco's quarterback room as a oh, quarterback okay. coach i think lewis riddick has been rumored to be in two or three final conversations for general manager or front office roles so yeah it's kind of interesting that i think those guys are heading sort of back to the league uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and Riddick, I think, is one of those guys kind of like Mayock that the public thinks a lot of because they see him a lot. 
I mean, I, I mean, Riddick makes sense to me, you know, when he talks. But I mean, you and I are just amateur fans. You know, I don't know how good he is or it really is or isn't in terms of managing a, a team. But I know the fans think highly of him because they see him every day, and he's smooth, and he can talk, and he presents very well, and all you know, all that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't. I, I I think you make a good point about the easier job. You know, he's paired with his buddy again, you know, to be Aikman and Buck. And they only have to do one thing a week. And newsflash, it isn't that hard. You know what they do? I mean, I know Chris knows. But they roll in like Saturday. Uh, you know, and they spend a day talking to the team, the teams, the coaches. And then they go home Monday night. And then they do it all over again. So it's it's really not that hard. And, you know, they're making millions of dollars for working three days a week. You know, sign me up. And they yeah, know where one- they're going. With one production staff, you know, it's another thing on Fox on Sunday or CBS, you know, they've got they're, they're in what eight markets or whatever with different, you know, this is ESPN has one game. They, you know, they, they can come in a day later than they would in terms of Steve's schedule. They have the same production unit. It just becomes a well-oiled machine. It, you know, it's it's it, it, it's standardized in ways that the Sunday broadcasts aren't. Yeah. And by the way, it appears as though Buck, they will not require Buck to do. um the Sunday night baseball broadcast. That's, that's not even part of his deal. Yeah. Not in Yeah. Yeah. That's what this, I, uh, yeah, here it is. So the quote is, this is, um, Andrew Marchand of the New York post being quoted in the article we cited before. It says, um, he would not be expected to do Sunday night baseball. He would likely be a producer on ESPN plus projects. So they're not even making him do that. And so that's even easier. Right. But now, now he's probably going to produce. He's probably going to go out and produce a documentary series about his dad. You know, he probably gets to do some special. <laughs> I'm serious. He probably gets some special vanity project. That's what that that means. The benefits of hair plugs. Yeah, right. Hair plugs for men. Um, <laughs> some other interesting news in the how you will watch and consume um, the NFL is that you know, which is zero per zero percent surprising. Um, but it looks like Apple really is emerging as the front runner on the, uh, the Sunday ticket, the direct, you know, the direct TV package, um, which is, is super interesting in many ways. Um, and just as, as we jump into this conversation, it really, my, I think I've mentioned this before, my wife works in music publicity. So we had to, uh, she had to watch the, uh, country music awards, which were exclusively on Amazon prime. And it was a really probably the only one that watched the country music awards (laughs) on Amazon. Uh, It was not, it was not a good broadcast, but it was really fascinating to watch, you know, because, you know, that's their sort of foray into live TV. Um, You no commercials. Yes. But constant commercials and and corporate tie ins throughout, you know, like the guy that plays the Reacher characters, like, you know, giving away awards and stuff like that. And what uh, from a sports context, it was NFL this NFL that. So even as we sit in the coldest moment of the NFL calendar um, and their first broadcast is what probably sometime in early September, you know, they were already using their uh, NFL, their NFL broadcast rights is a major, major advertising push here, you know, this far out. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so if you want to read more about this, we found this on Bleacher Report again. Apple eyeing NFL media Sunday ticket in multi-billion dollar package deal by Aaron Walsh, March 4th, 2022. Yeah, so Apple's thinking big. Um, what They, they want to take the entire um, Sunday, tic- Sunday ticket package and be the exclusive provider of it. I mean, you have to sign up for Apple TV, presumably, to get the Sunday ticket or a, some sort of Apple platform um to get it um you know i I think this live sport i I think you bring up an interesting point i didn't even know the country music awards had happened and i didn't know they were on amazon um it's interesting that you bring that up because yeah i think it was that's probably the first true amazon produced live event they've ever done because when amazon has broadcast nfl games all they've done is taken the stream from the network and just broadcast it. it they've never they haven't produced any of it um, so I, I think it's a major step in this Apple thing. Um, you know, they're not going to be producing it themselves. The Sunday ticket is just the network broadcast of these games repurposed, you know, onto a streaming platform. Um, 
So I think Apple has designs at bigger things. It's very expensive, but it may be a bit more of a baby step than Amazon, which is trying to actually produce live events of their own. Personally, if you ask me, I think the NFL is dumb in terms of audience, maybe not financially, but in terms of audience reach. I think the NFL would be dumb not to sell it to every platform who wants it. Exactly like the NBA and Major League Baseball have done, there are a myriad of ways to buy the NBA. And hockey has some. I don't know about I can't speak to hockey. All three other sports have the hockey, hockey. has the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Like Major League Baseball, because my son and I were just talking about it last night. We need to order it again. <laughs> you can order it directly, a streaming package directly through Major League Baseball. You can order it through, if you have cable like we do, you can order extra innings through cable. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And the NBA is the same way. Hockey is the same way. Um, so I think in terms of reach, that's the way to go. But if somebody's going to throw enough money at the NFL to be the exclusive provider, who cares about the fans? They'll take the money, and I don't blame them. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I, – I agree with you. I wish that they'd done I wish they'd done that for the last 25 years. Um, but they don't need to, right? Like they, they think they can get them more money this way. So I don't see that changing. No. Um and I think in some ways a move – well, I think Apple is clearly the front – there's two reasons I think Apple's clearly the front runner. One, they may have the deepest pockets of anybody that is in the game here. Even more, more than Amazon? Yeah, probably. It's probably also if you just factor that Amazon's already paying, right? So, like, that has to be part of their calculus. And, you know, I, I, I don't know their balance sheets, but but – I think they've got deeper pockets, available money maybe, less leverage Whose money. market cap is bigger? Do you know off the top of your head, is it Amazon or Apple? I don't know. I think it's probably Apple. Um, for I think for those of you who don't want market cap, market cap is a way to value publicly traded companies and basically you take the value of the outstanding stock by the number of shares and boom, that's market cap. So it's, it's what well, it was, that was me asking what was a bigger company. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So, yes. So, and they have, are the slowest out of the gate with anything live. And, you know, so they're going to, and so to compete, they're going to need some version of just add water live television. And to Steve's point, what's a, you know, what's a better splash, just add water move than the NFL and they don't really have to build a whole thing, right? They just are buying that, you know. All the, the the red zone and how they do it and the you know they'll just buy all that infrastructure as part of this deal. So they just you know they'll they'll sort of buy the studios so to speak as they buy the broadcast rights. So they don't, but it gives them a pretty giant foothold into some kind of version of live TV. And here's where I think Steve, this might actually be a step closer to what you're talking about than you might realize, is that let's look at the hardware. So TVs themselves are really starting to come with all of these capabilities baked in. And that includes things like the Apple app baked in. So it's not that dissimilar to how your cable box now, you would buy these things through your cable box. The TVs just baked into the, the guts of the TV can do these things. So you get a new TV, you open it up, you can just activate Apple right there. You know, So I think in some ways... It gets into the homes in an easier way, and not it's not the same. It's not apples to oranges, but I think because where the industry is going is you load up the TVs with these capabilities. I think for the majority of consumers, it'll actually be an easier path to purchase. Yeah, I'm a bit of an anachronism. I, you know, I, I don't like having a whole bunch of subscriptions, a bunch of things, and I'm – a little bit more willing to increase my one cable bill by a few bucks than I am to subscribe to a bunch of different products. But I, I'm probably, again, that's I'm probably in the minority in that regard. Um, one of the things this this article did go in through it go into was that they mentioned that Apple's looked into other live sports. They're looking into the Pac-12 and the WNBA for the three people that watch that sport. Um, so they're looking into. They're they're trying to tiptoe into other things, um, which you know that's more live broadcast. You know that's more live broadcasts. You know that, that that they'll have to figure out. But the NBA is cert- or the NFL rather is certainly the you know the the million pound gorilla to to, to go first. It's so funny because 
you know, we talked about we've talked about this because it has so much impact on sports over over the years of the show, really. And even as the years that we've done the show, you, we've seen just, you know, like plate tectonic level shifts in some of this stuff, really. Um, but, you know, and everything is old is new again approach. I really think what you'll see what is you buy a TV. It comes it's a smart TV. And it comes loaded with all these things. And then it, you turn it on and it's going to say, would you like to bundle these services for a one time, you know, a monthly fee? And you might even be able to check boxes. So, yes, I'll take Amazon Prime and I'll take Apple and I'll take Hulu, but I don't want these. You'll make your selections. You'll activate your TV and you'll get billed monthly. I really, <laughs> I, I really around, think, goes around. Kind yeah, of. <laughs> the, the, the television set will just be basically embedded a big cable, box. cable box that you then sort of a la carte your subscription when you turn it on it's all right that's sort of what xfinity yeah, cable it's is half there yeah you know because it's where you know they provide a basic number of channels whatever it is and then i've got the super deluxe premium package or whatever and that just comes with a bunch of things bundled hbo and hbo max and peacock plus and you know a bunch of other whatever else there is um so yeah it's it's a bit ironic you know, that it's sort of coming around because I do think people are getting tired of having to subscribe to a bunch of different things. And I think everybody would want one bill, you know, in the way in the manner you're suggesting. I think every anybody with a brain would rather do that than have they have to keep up with 10 different TV subscriptions all at once. And so at some point, somebody's going to have to do that. And if it takes like Samsung and Sony do it, you know. Good. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the future, which is, again, I think it's a bit ironic. And it's now it's why you got these companies fight, because if, if you're look if in that model, then and you're making those choices, uh, either a la carte or the bundle or the, all the packages in between, um, then you're going to say, well, you know, I'm going to, you know, I, I need the NFL. Right. And so, you know, like, I think that's why they're going to all and it, it could be something different for other people it could be, you know, local news or whatever. But whatever, you know, they're going to make sure that these, you know, that become these media packages. It's so funny. We've we've replaced live television. And now they're all going to be fighting to, uh, you know, to get back into live television. <laughs> it's 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 very ironic and it's really things coming full circle in a way that you and I predicted years ago, like, like, you know, like you said, when we started the show, we've been talking about this forever, seems like, and we both predicted at the time, we're going to get to the point where somebody's going to bundle these things together. And here, look, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's kind of funny, um, but I, I'm, I don't like Amazon. I, I don't do Amazon. I'm not a prime member. I can stomach, having to subscribe to Apple, whatever, more than Amazon. So I'm personally rooting for Apple to win the battle. Well, they care more about your privacy and security of any of the other tech giants. Well, that's why I don't like Amazon. One of the main re big reasons. And Amazon, I mean, like Amazon controls 75% of the internet market, and they're really a giant. I just, I just, I just don't like that. Uh, they, they are a necessary evil. I'm not a big Amazon fan myself. Um, although Amazon with web service is like yeah, I was gonna say with Steven Brink was their their secret jewel that no one really talks about is which is Amazon web services. Yeah, it's truly controls. I think 75 percent of the web services on the on the internet. Yeah, and you know they left they laughed at Bezos when he when he launched that business line. Yeah, they did. You know, like we the the hog sty is not hosted by them because they were too expensive. But um, man, I, I mean, they, there's just a lot of power in that one company, and I just don't like participating. Um, so we will see. It is certainly interesting. Uh, but you know, RIP Directv. That that's the one thing that you need to understand here. <laughs> yeah, or just rest. I don't know if they're going to rest in peace. Just rest. Um, so there you go. They're going bye bye soon. Soon just enough. Say R to Directv. Rest. <laughs> yeah. All right, Steve. So uh, I know you're running out of uh, this recording booth into the next recording booth. So what are you guys going to be talking about on the hog sty? Well, yeah, I mean, the next episode of The Hogsty, by the time you're listening to this, will have already been released, and we'll certainly get into all the latest in Washington quarterback drama and stadium drama and sexual harassment drama and all that stuff. We're into our off-season schedule of one show per week. Um, 
So check us out there. Seasons of Discontent will be with Rick Snyder, which is his look at all things Washington, D.C. sports and life. We'll be back probably to do a uh, um, free agency recap, and then they'll be back around the draft. You know, only take some time off in the off season, And then we have all of our regular written content. All right. We will see you in two weeks.